You're listening to the Archaeology Podcast Network. Welcome to episode 70 of the Life in Ruins podcast, where we investigate the careers of those living a life in ruins. I'm your host, Carlton Gover, and I'm joined by my co-hosts, Connor Johnnan and David Howe. Today, we are joined by one of the Life in Ruins podcast's biggest fans, Stefan Milo, to talk about the origins of early states in the Indian subcontinent. Stefan, thank you so much for deciding to come on to the podcast. Very much last minute, I think we notified you. Five hours ago, uh, we were doing this. How are you doing today, bud? I feel like I'm, uh, I don't know if I'm your biggest fan or arch nemesis after <laughs> listening to the last one, but, but uh, yeah, uh, I'm good. I'm, I'm ready. I'm ready to go toe to toe. Good, man. Yeah, you're definitely, I just realized this as we were talking, I think our first like three-timer veteran on the, the podcast, I think we've had Chris twice. What a and terrible yeah. indictment of a Life and Ruins podcast. <laughs> <laughs> We're scraping the barrel. We texted yeah. Stefan and out, what was it? Like at noon today? Hey, can you can you come on to talk about ancient India civilizations? And he was like, I, I guess. Yeah. <laughs> Here we are. Solely based on the fact we watched his YouTube video on there being an ancient communist society possibly in India. Possibly. That's the debate. Well, good stuff. Connor, where is India? <laughs> I don't know how to segue to the it's, first point. It's on the Indian subcontinent, I'm guessing. So I guess in previous episodes we talked about, we did South America and kind of the origins in the intro to what civilization is, state societies, things like that. So we're taking a little trip towards the, the Indus Valley and kind of India in general to kind of there's like this another another flourishment of state societies that kind of emerge there. It takes a little while. It's kind of a later development. Have any of you guys even visited India? Been there? I Never. have not. No. No. Okay. Not me or anyone in my family. I've seen the Jungle Book, both the cartoon and the live action by John Favreau. Both are you know cool with me, and yeah. that's the connection I have with India. Oh, I also recently tried non bread with you guys in Colorado. So <laughs> India is bound uh, on the North end by the Himalayas, all the water and all that stuff flows down into the Indian ocean. Uh, ultimately, I mean, the important kind of river for this area is the Indus river, which is the place where you see all these civilizations pop up, but you don't really see that in the archeological record until about 7,000 or so. BCE, like I feel like that's like a similar time period to we see like the the Neolithic Revolution in um, South America at that same sort of mm. time, right? What about like three thousand BC or yeah? Well, I think if if we're talking in terms of Neolithic, we might be jumping the gun a little bit. I think the Neolithic starts in uh, in the Indian subcontinent, more sort of six thousand five hundred BCE, as far as I'm aware long before we get to like the emergence of a uh, full civilization quote unquote i know we need to use that in a very nuanced way but but yeah india's uh, like at a really interesting geographical place because on its uh, eastern side northeastern side uh borders china where like neolithic society is developed around the domestication of rice and on its uh, western side borders iran which is, is of course heavily connected to the fertile crescent and the domestication of wheat and, and goats and all these things. So it is a super interesting geographical location for this whole uh, development in our history. That's a really interesting point, actually, because, yeah, those are two really big, you know, different cultural things, like combining together into the, yeah, and I guess like Indian cuisine kind of reflects that too. Yeah, and along with other domesticates, zebu cattle, which we mentioned in the domesticates in order to find them episode. They're domesticated here along with, as Stefan said, um, wheat and barley, although barley wasn't completely domesticated yet. I'm not sure what that means. I guess it was really close to being so. Horticulture or something at that point. Yeah. Yeah. It might mean that it wasn't like an imported crop. Because I think if you, when you find like a region that is next to the area where it was domesticated, that 
culture just has domesticated versions of the crop. And mm-hmm. when you see like this slow progression from wild to domesticated, I think it might indicate that India is like a key region in the domestication of that crop. If you, right. see, you see what I mean. Yeah. Like one of the earliest like Neolithic sites we have is I'm going to, I'm going to butcher all these Indian words. Mergar, Magar, M E H R G A R H. And, Mega, uh, Megara, Megara is a fair Mer- pronunciation. Megar, yeah, which is 125 miles west of the Indus River, and it was uh, predominantly occupied by village farmers for 6,000 BC. Okay, and it contains uh, graves which have copper artifacts, and imported imported turquoise from Iran and shells from the coast of the Arabian Sea. And it's thought that maybe they were obtained through exchange of like sending cotton that way and getting these goods from the West in return. Well, and I also think that the domestication came from the, the Near East as well. So like the, the knowledge of that comes comes from there too. So there's a lot of interchange and movement of at least of people and ideas between the Near East and, and India, which is cool. And you can kind of really see the influence of it a little bit. One of the cooler things I did find at Mergar is at least some evidence for uh, early dentistry. So. Um, there's at least 11 teeth from nine individuals that show evidence of drilling, and it's not for any sort of like ceremonial or decorative purposes, but they're used to to stop something or uh, save the teeth um, rather than religious or decorative purposes. So that's a that's a cool little piece to come out of that. Sounds like they're enjoying a nutritious and delicious Neolithic <laughs> diet. If I do say so myself. <laughs> like all these early civilizations get themselves into like these people are messing with teeth, the Inca, and then over there we're doing trepanation. You just you get bored and you gotta drill holes into yourself. Well it's like if you have sandstone that you're like grinding stuff on and then all that little grains get into the, the food you eat, the wheat, right. the corn, you know, and it just destroys your teeth because I I think Egyptian teeth, like from the early periods, are like completely worn down from grit from sand. If I remember correctly, yeah, I've heard that yeah, yeah. Like you uh, see, like a lot of skeletons out out that way. The teeth, like the caps of the teeth, like the crowns, are just like completely gone. All from all that. Yikes! Stone in the bread, and on top of that, like getting the cavities from all the starches. It sounds miserable. <laughs> on, isn't that great? And also just have like beer all the time. I was going to say beer, like gut. Um, anyway, so I think we talked a lot about last time about how early like Moche and um, early South American civilizations over in the Western Hemisphere were kind of either in mountains or in between mountains and those like plains between the coast. I know Indus Valley civilization was like, because the Indus River is like up by Pakistan and not down towards like the south. So it's not like a jungle environment, but are we looking at like a same kind of like an Egypt looking situation or Mesopotamian or is it kind of like a lush green area like China? I think it's lush and green because it's being fed by a bunch of tributaries from the Himalayas. So you have, and so this is like Northwestern India on the border of Pakistan. So you have the Hakra River, Gagar River and others that all feed into the Indus, which then leads out into the Arabian Sea. Okay. This is a pretty green and lush area. I believe this is also like if you've seen the great documentary, Alexander the Great, this is where the elephant battle takes place. Oh, the high despis. Yeah. yeah. Okay. So that's like in near this area. Yeah. It's very jungly. Okay. Really? I thought it would have been more arid. Huh. I'm pretty sure they just gave the Muslims the desert and said, enjoy Pakistan. I think the area that we're describing is is deceptively large. I don't think, you know, across the course of the Indus River, I think there's going to be a lot of different climates. Like coastal India is for sure going to be much uh, more different to areas mm-hmm. further upstream. Like India is basically like half the size of the USA. This Indus River is huge. It is one of the world's biggest rivers, I believe. So yeah, I guess like the Mississippi River is like long and the, all those civilizations are all up and down it, not just in Mississippi. Does that make sense? Um, this map I'm looking at has two deserts described on it too. So that's a thing. It's very Ch- lush. <laughs> the Cholestan <laughs> Desert and the Thar Desert. And we're, we should mention um, that we're looking at like the southwest or the northwest corner of, of India. We're not looking at like the 
the lower subcontinent. Right, or the, next to Iran. Uh, yeah, nothing, Iran. nothing down there. We're really there's like a small little area close to kind of the the Near East more than more than anything is where these things kind of emerge. David, you know Pakistan is between India and Afghanistan, and then it's Iran, right? Yeah. So okay. I'm pretty sure Pakistan borders Iran directly. Okay, I thought there was... And like Afghanistan, though, right? Yep. Yeah. Yeah. Okay. okay. Them, yeah. I thought India touched a little bit in the bottom. I guess not. I think, it, uh, I think it does. But really, I think we need... You know, when we say we're talking here about the Indian subcontinent, you know, this civilization wasn't following modern boundaries. You can find these sites in India, in Pakistan. Uh, this is Nepal. Not, this is using India in like the geographical sense, I feel like, rather than a, a political nation state. That makes sense. Yeah. Okay. So according to the illustrations I'm looking at here, it does look pretty much arid like Mesopotamia with the river. Carlton says it's green and lush. So I don't know which source to trust here, but either way. It could be green and lush and surrounded by desert. It's true. It's fertile. We're getting hung up on, or I am, on the, you know, the, uh, the geographic area here. Mm-hmm. So what should we dive into next? Is this Neolithic or is this Bronze Age? Did we say that? This is Neolithic moving yes, into right. bronze. Yeah, uh, right. but, but part of the geography deal, though, southern India has been much less intensively studied archaeologically. So very much this could be a byproduct of because this is a major river drainage. They're finding more archaeology there, whereas like mm-hmm. the deserts that flank it. You might have, you know, just like the Great Pyramids, they might be under a couple. I imagine they don't have giant sand dunes, but, you know, you catch the drift with the sand drift. Yeah. (laughs) Yeah. I mean, at the start, when you said the Neolithic started a little later here, I think that could entirely be uh, just a bias in our archaeological record for sure. And, And even going back into the Paleolithic, India is becoming like a huge area of study because... You know, we have really? like early humans in Africa in the Middle East, and we have a lot of evidence for humans in, in East Asia. Of course, they had to travel through this region. And so, like, Indian archaeology is uh, is an area where there's going to be a lot of discoveries for sure. Well, especially when you, we, the more we study China, too, and, and get a, an understanding of that as well, I think that's going to even, even add more credence to the idea that we need to study these kind of in-between areas. According to the official national Chinese archaeological interpretations, humans evolved out of China. The first civilizations were out of China, and they were all communist. That's not made up. That's that's communist party fact. Interesting. So, so yeah, maybe we do have much earlier <laughs> neolithization happening in India because they're right next door since China is the uh, home of all things human. Hashtag free Winnie the Pooh. Oh, my God. And I, I guess to, to second Stefan's point there, like if you're looking at a map of the world, all the humans that went down towards Southeast Asia and Australia probably would have hugged closer to India than gone up through Asia and back down. So that makes sense too. There'd probably be tons. And I assume India in the Pleistocene was still kind of similar to how it is today. Probably a little more cold, but and dry. maybe it was a pine forest instead of jungle. I don't know. I'd have to check. Anyway, getting. I'm just really trying to get the image in my head of like what this looks like for some reason. <laughs> Listen to Life in Ruins, listeners. If you don't know where India is, Google it. Okay? We, just, we can't describe it any better than we just did. <laughs> exactly. Oh, we didn't mention, though, that India was, you know, its own place and then converged up into the continents there. And that's what made the Himalayas. We got we yeah. to throw that in there. You got real smashy. Yeah. That's why they're the tallest mountains in the world, too, because it's the most recent to smash. Super um, smash. Um, and at, Yes. And at the end, so this important Neolithic site that goes into the Bronze and Copper Age, Megar, even, even during this time where you do have this large settlement of farmers coming together and living in these structured settlements, you still have surrounding populations practicing hunting and gathering. So it's still part of that same Neolithic transition where you do have those growing corn, their teeth are falling out, and then... You have the buff hunting and gathering populations coming into trade back and forth with nice teeth and no arthritis. Outrageous. (laughs) Did you say structured settlement? Do you need cash now? (laughs) I was trying to figure out if you'd catch it. There you go. Cool. On that, J.G. Wentworth. 
Yeah. You know, so I think we're gonna. <laughs> we're gonna Chris, insert, in, insert that right here. <laughs> <laughs> Free advertising. All right, so we'll be right back with um, segment two of episode seventy with Stefan Milo. Welcome back to episode seventy. Stefan is still with us, and we're gonna be moving on from talking about the site of Mirgar into the early Indus period, which is the late fourth and early third millennia. BCE. And part of this, like, unlike going back to the geography, unlike the Nile, which is one long stretch of river, this Indus River Valley area is multiple rivers with multiple tributaries. So you do have this dense river system within the desert that's creating these massive floodplains. Indus, this early Indus period, settlements are kind of spread out throughout this this region of tributaries. So it's not just like the Nile where you can dot it up and down. And, you know, there's an interesting little tidbit where some have hypothesized that the construction of these early cities, which have walls, which is a key feature of early states, rather than for defense, some have postulated that these walls have been intended as protection against floods rather than their neighbors because of how many tributaries and waterways feed into the not uh not the nile the indus that's cool yeah it, it's possible it's possible i think a lot of a lot of these ideas about these uh, walls not being used for defense date back to quite early in the 20th century 1920s 1930s and i think it's fair to say there are there are a few archaeologists that are questioning that now. Hmm. So several of them have like features like bastions and complicated gateways and things like that that aren't really what you would build, put in a wall for flood defense, but but you would include them in a wall if you were going to shoot someone, perhaps. <laughs> Here's a question: If it was an ancient communist utopia, were the walls to keep people in? Is anyone asking that question? Probably not. Probably not. They're probably not asking that question. Yeah, <laughs> I would say. But I mean, the walls, I don't think, from what I see, look like think, they do keep they, people in. They could yeah. probably just leave. I mean, eventually they abandoned them anyway, so it's not like... Yeah. They're not cages. <laughs> so, and... <laughs> Good Lord. And, these, and these, are, these occur at multiple sites across this area. So it's not just one site that has this, some sort of defensive structure, right, Stefan? Yeah, right. I mean, I, I know with, there are several sites we've mentioned. Dolavira is more towards the uh, coast. You know, the walls at this site, I think, if I remember rightly, are about 18 meters thick. So this is real, like, megalithic. Uh, megalithic is probably the wrong wow. term, but because they're made out of bricks. This is construction on a huge scale. Yeah, and, and Mo, Mohen... Jadara, which is another major Indus city, with a population estimated at like perhaps 35,000. There's kind of like this high rise podium of a citadel. And it's, do you find this at other sites? And this, these perimeter walls are on parts of the lower cities across all of these, which I think is part of that whole early 20th century hypothesis that Stefan has mentioned. Now, Stefan, yeah. you did a, a, you released a video on YouTube on your channel, Stefan Milo. I think we talked about it last time you were on that you're about to release it when we had, I think we recorded you back in like December or January. Cause I remember being in West Virginia when we recorded you to come back. Maybe. Yeah. It would have been around that time. It came out in January. Yeah. January 30th. Wow. This year's uh, flown by. It, yeah. <laughs> yeah. Better than 2020. Um, yeah. Titled an ancient communist utopia question mark, the Indus Valley civilization. So we're kind of getting into like early Indus. Are we, are we even in the right ballpark and time frame in, in what you're invest, what you investigated in this video or is this, uh, hypothesis of, of early communism or this utopia a little bit later? Well, I think the early Harappan is a, a period that is not super well understood. I think it's rough time frame starts at like 3300 BCE. Again, in researching that video, you know, it is possible that this early Harappan stage has its roots in about 5000 BCE. So it really is a contemporary of all the sort of more well-known early civilizations of the old world in, in Mesopotamia and China and Egypt. And there seems to have been like a big cultural shift for whatever reason around uh, 2600 BCE, 
And uh, that is what archaeologists uh, who study that period call the mature Harappan. And that is when these cities uh, increase in size and they develop writing systems that we can't read and like standardized systems of measurements over this huge area and and all of these things. And and allegedly they were a, a peaceful society and were allegedly an egalitarian society. Both ideas are possible a lot of um but a lot of archaeologists are, are questioning whether that that assessment was correct because both these ideas really as i said stem back to the early 20th century and uh, you know we've had 100 years more excavations and research and all of this uh, stuff mm-hmm. going on in the region and those ideas are perhaps not so well supported by the evidence anymore but as, as American archaeologists, am I right in thinking that people had similar ideas about the classical Maya at one point, that they were a peaceful society and then their writing system was deciphered and, you know, they... They did some blood residue were violent on those steps. As else. <laughs> <laughs> uh, I never heard that, actually, but I could see I could that be being way the off case. On that. I could be way off on That's just what okay. I heard. Well, you bring up two really good points. So, like, the reason the Harappan civilization is roughly like the culture area that it flourished over is over 1,295,000 square kilometers, which is just over 500,000 square miles, which is larger than modern day Pakistan. And so you have the Indus and the Sarawati valleys are the cultural focus of this, of this civilization. Um, The largest sites here, we're talking about Harappa and I think it's, the region of Punjab, Punjab, yeah, Punjab. yes, uh, Harappa and Punjab and Mohenjo-daro and Sindh. Then you have these other sites like Ganwar, Ganwarawala, on the Saro, Saraswati, and Dolavira in Gujarat. And and it's like as as Stefan said, there's we don't know much about the civilization. Primarily, we don't know anything about the elites. There's not much iconography. There's one pedestal or statue of a dude with a beard that they're not quite sure. But the big thing is that we don't know much about it that Stefan hinted at is we haven't deciphered their writing. So like with the Maya, we figured everything about them real quick. Once the Maya code was cracked by that Russian archaeologist back in the 80s, we have not cracked the Harappan code. Even if we did, though just to interject super briefly, I think the longest inscription we've found is only 26 characters. So even if we do decipher it, there is presumably only so much information that you can convey in such short texts. Yeah. How many- is it like, is it a safe assumption to assume that there was sort of an elite? I mean, these, these, these places don't create themselves, you know, you can't assume they're all, I mean, I guess, I guess the, the, the assumption is that they were this communist society that everyone worked together to build these these large structures and whatnot. But that's not really shown anywhere else in the world in these kind of early states. There is always some sort of hierarchy of folks who are the leaders who are organizing and motivating the workers around there. So I feel like it's a safe assumption to say there was some sort of elite and we might be missing pieces of that. That's definitely a fair assumption for sure. I think there are some interesting tidbits, uh, some quirks in the archaeological record, which do support, I'm not saying that there was absolutely no hierarchy whatsoever, um, but these sites are interesting in that, you know, at Mahenjo-daro and Harappa, the two biggest cities there does, is not seemingly any like variation in the sizes of houses, really. Even houses of, you know, what you could call like common people have their bathrooms connected into like sewer systems that run through the city. And to compare that to like the common person in Mesopotamia or Egypt, that really is the height of luxury. To be able to have like, not indoor plumbing, probably 
they had to get water from a well, but they have wells adjacent to their houses and they have bathrooms that flush their waste into connected urban sewer systems. That really is incredible for the common man to have those features. And also, if we compare it to their neighboring civilizations like uh, China, Mesopotamia, Iran, Egypt, their, their contemporaries, like the social hierarchy in those regions is extremely obvious. You can't really miss the pyramids. Do you know mm-hmm. what I mean? Society was obviously very hierarchical. And uh, we just don't have, as far as I'm aware, anything like that for the Indus Valley civilization. So if whoever was given the orders, they seemingly did not enrich their lives in the same way that kings did in other regions. I have this little tidbit from Scar and Fagan, if you guys wouldn't mind if I'd read that real real quick. We know little of the Indus social organization, religious beliefs. Those who ruled Harappa and Mohenjo-Daro remain anonymous for they never commemorated their deeds on grandiose palace walls or enriched homes and left almost no portraits. One exception is a small limestone figure from Mohenjo-Daro that depicts a thick-lipped bearded man staring at the world through slitted eyes. He seems to be withdrawn in meditation, perhaps detached from worldly affairs. That's a reach. Uh, The man wears an embroidered robe that was once inlaid with metal. The only clue to his statue is that one soldier or shoulder is uncovered, a sign of reverence during Buddha's lifetime more than 1,500 years later. Um, So far, archaeology reveals leadership by uh, rulers, perhaps merchants, ritual specialists, or people who control key resources or large areas of land. Um, They seem to have led unastatious lives marked by complete lack of priestly pomp or lavish public display. So whereas in all these other contemporaneous people where you basically have a bunch of elitely marketing, we just don't see that here because clearly you have this large, we don't know if we're dealing with city states, theater states, or one large region controlled by one polity because there's just none of the flash of elites that we'd usually expect to see. Is there a chance that it's like a merchant republic? Have we covered that? It could be. That's one of the theories that it's just basically a bunch of rich guys and that's that is, yeah, that is one of the ideas behind the writing too, is that these are badges of office perhaps, because hmm. many of the seals that we call them, we call them seals, but they weren't necessarily all used as seals, but they're sort of carved on soft stone and they have loops on the back. So it seems like they were designed to be hung from something. And uh, they typically have a picture of an animal and then a short undecipherable text that that goes along with it and one idea is that these represent you know merchant guilds social groups priestly groups tribal groups you know we're we're not sure we're ultimately just missing the scale of everywhere everywhere else i mean there's smaller hints at maybe some sort of class structure but it's just not yeah as monumental Yes, you know, as 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 we're seeing everywhere else. Okay, okay. And their like, their social stratigraphy could have been, you know, not necessarily in, let's say, like the you know the concrete walls and stuff or the stone walls, but it could have been like based on the clothes you were wearing or just like items you had and that we just can't see. Like if you had the finest silks from China, you were the leader. But like most people wore tunics or something. But they all lived in the same houses. I don't know. I mean, I'm going to speculate. I I can't imagine that they were ruled by a king and that that king did not attempt to display their power in some overt way. Yeah. Do you know yeah. what I mean? You really see that. If there's like some sort of system where there's a monarchy, you really see a palace, a, you know, a wall, a monument to their to their glory, or at least like a, someone's got a bowling like, alley in their basement. In Bronze Age Europe, yeah, yeah. Bronze Age Europe didn't really have urban centers like this, but you still see like individual burials, uh, burials that are seemingly given much more significance, burials with a lot of material goods. You can still see hierarchy even in these non-urban societies, and it seems like we, I mean. We just don't see evidence of that in in the Indus Valley. That's fascinating. I didn't really and know then, anything and, about this. And this isn't like uh, an enclosed world. I mean, they're trading with East Africa, like all along the East African coast, Mesopotamia, Egypt, 
and even to um, Southeast Asia. Like this is a major, along a major trading hub. So that would make sense that it's like a transient place where you like you came to, you know, chill while you sold stuff and then went back. Yeah. And they had colonies in Afghanistan. So you have this complex urban civilization that just doesn't seem to have this monumental elite architecture that's that's pretty ubiquitous across the globe and a script that seems to be a mix of kind of like the maya script it's phonetic and also pictographic so some whatever that means you know you know what i mean like it's a mix yeah. of yeah it looks like hieroglyphs but also like mesopotamian what is that stuff yeah, so like certain symbols are phonetic and other ones just represent the word itself. So it's a mix, which makes it harder, but there's only like 400 different Can pictographic find, symbols. Okay. Well, I think and one of the on challenges these- is because we can't read the writing and we know so little about it, one of the big debates is how many characters did they have or are we seeing like, you know, one character transform over time? Yeah. Mm-hmm. And all of these things. So we re- we're like, we're ba- basically we don't know. Like <laughs> We don't know a lot about them. Yeah. Huh. I'm looking at the writing now. I didn't really see this before. Yeah, it's interesting. And as Stefan said, they're on these seals or other short inscriptions. So huh. there's not much of it to go off of. So you have possibly 400 different pictographs. Some might just be the same one, but illustrated differently. But we don't have a Rosetta Stone or we don't have these huge Maya stele, right? Mm-hmm. So... And we don't even know the language family because India is an incredibly diverse place. We don't even know the language family that this alphabet even applies to. Because yeah. like theoretically, it would be Indo-European, but that's like not till later. Yeah, yeah that's it could be an Indo-European, like modern Indian languages in the north are Indo-European languages, mm-hmm. and in the in the south they're not. But this is so long ago that we can't really say that, oh, they're right. speaking some variation of Indo-European. You know, we can't really say that, I think. Yeah. yeah. That's but neat. we can say that this Indus civilization reached its peak around 2300 BCE and uh, people just dipped out. And definitely hmm. looks like these urban populations just dispersed into smaller sediment, settlements over an enormous area. We're so also going to abandon this segment and go God. to <laughs> segment three of a Life Members podcast, episode 70 with Stefan Milos. I will catch you in the third segment. Welcome back to episode 70 of a Life and Nerds podcast. I got the number right this time. We're here with Connor John and Carlton Gover and Stefan Milo. We are talking about India and the Indus Valley civilization. Guys, where is India? <clears throat> All right. I just wanted to do that. Now Carlton, take away. <laughs> <laughs> so in, another interesting case that we've already kind of talked, we have talked about in these past two segments where this Harappan civilization kind of breaks the norms of what we expect from early states. Well, after the collapse or dispersal of these urban populations into the surrounding areas, we have what's what archaeologists referred to as this rural interlude from about 2000 BCE to 600 BCE. The dates... It just depends on what book you're reading, what article they vary, like, you know, 2000 BC plus or minus 100, right? That Northeastern India, which had this long history of these mercantile states, the civilization, people just go back to farming and they're building on top of these sites. And there seems to be no centralized polities that it's just these dispersed populations just hanging out. Whereas usually when you see early states arise when they collapse something else takes over so you see that in mesopotamia egypt and elsewhere and that this uh, idea of statehood and and centralized government spreads from these areas but in the indus like after they do this harappan thing people just don't do it for 1400 years well have you heard any ideas as to why that happened i i have heard one go for it so there is a river in Indian uh, sort of tradition, you could say the Sarasvati River, which is mentioned in some of the earliest Indian texts that exist, the Vedas. And that river is basically unknown. It doesn't, it doesn't exist anymore. It's dried up. And if you look at the um, location of Indus Valley sites, 
a lot of them are grouped along and are not grouped along a river anymore. There seems to be some sign that there there was a missing river in that region. Uh, let me see if I can find you guys a picture, which will be impossible to share with the listeners. <laughs> but if you uh, take a look at this massive Google Images link that I've just sent you, there is like a real cluster of Harappan sites, Indus Valley sites in the center. They're at, and this is actually the highest concentration of sites, I think, that exist. And it's not along a river anymore. And so there is one idea that, you know, perhaps climate change causing this core region of Indus Valley civilization to be abandoned. That would do it if their river disappears. Yeah. Um, The other idea is this might coincide with the Aryan invasion from up north. And this is kind of the same period people hypothesize this is when Indo-Iranian, Indo-Aryan comes into the Indian subcontinent. I mean, this has been the trying to figure out the Aryans and this language group, you know, that's just going into a whole other, you know, buffet of canned worms. Right. It was you probably know. a very complex process to, to cause that level of uh, change, regardless of what hap- what it was. It yeah. was no doubt pretty complex. 100%. And rice gets introduced in this area, so it becomes even more profitable just to be a farmer. Yeah, it's just... This is just a very interesting time in this region. And there's just so many mysteries in Indian archaeology. And I imagine a lot of it because the further south you get in India, the more jungle you get, right? Jungle-like. And the soil becomes more acidic and it's kind of similar to central Mexico Mm. where biological remains will not last in the record. And as we mentioned in the first segment, like northeastern India is far more archaeologically investigated than southern and southeastern India. Well, that, yeah. And and we don't even seemingly know what the Indus Valley people did with their dead. Mm-hmm. Um, we don't really get many burials. We don't really get signs of cremation. But again, current populations in India do uh, dispose of their dead, at least some people in the river. So it's not wild. I was about to say, just toss them in the river. I mean, Tossamen might be doing it a disservice, (laughs) (laughs) but they they dispose of their dead uh, in the river. And considering the the Indus Valley's civilization's uh, keen uh, water management and and hygiene, you know, it's not impossible to think that water played some uh, important role in their society too. Hmm. Mm Mm-hmm. And uh, I don't know if you guys ever saw River Monsters with Jeremy Wade. The practice of dumping their dead into the rivers has led to like ginormous man-eating catfish called the Goonch. Oh, God. Brilliant Such name. A... The Goonch? The Goonch. If you haven't watched it, go watch it. It's worth a... It's worth. It's like the first episode. I think his last episode, he goes to recatch it Mm -hmm. like years later after that whole area has been built up by cities and they think it's just too polluted for him. He can't... He couldn't reel it in. So the goonch might be gone. <laughs> I can't remember the sound. Uh, be like, the oh, goonch is on your heart, yeah. man. Goonch is a lifestyle, <laughs> not a... <laughs> the goonch life chose me, dude. Um, <laughs> uh, so what, what takes over after... Because like in the break, we were talking about Macedonians. Uh, that's a little far later. But what takes over directly after like Mahenjadaro and, and after that? So you get, and particularly around the Ganges Valley, you do see the, particularly in northern Pakistan, mark the beginning of the classic period of South Asian civilization. You see the return of urban areas with definitive class structures so we can see the elites. Mm-hmm. But, you know, around, fifth, uh, at, in not around, at, at 516 BCE, King Darius, a Persian, invaded northwest, Mm -hmm. northwest India, becomes part of the Persian Empire. You see Persian influence uh, entering the Indian subcontinent. And then, um, you know, two centuries later, Alexander the Great comes in to the same area, takes it over, introduces Hellenistic culture. And then, you know, he bounces back and dies in, he dies in Egypt, right? Uh, Babylon. Babylon. 
and it creates this power vacuum. So you had two major superpowers and like basically get to Northeast India, modern day India, introduce Mediterranean cultures and science and basically introduce them to the Mediterranean world. And then there's kind of this power vacuum and there are these polities in Southern India that kind of take advantage of this power vacuum. The kingdom of Mag- Magadha, led by Chandragupta Mara of oh, Magadha. Okay. Yeah. So There's this is what he Ashoka shows up. At some point, I think that's a person. Yes, that's his grandson, Ahsoka. Okay. And so this is the Mauryan Empire, and it, and it dominates pretty much, uh, encompasses into Pakistan all of the early Indus civilization to the Bay of Bengal, basically just south of the Himalayas, but doesn't manage to extend to the tip of India, but is a much broader geographic region. And this is a Buddhist society through and through. And so these are really the early historic cities that we see that we know much about in the Indian subcontinent. And this is kind of it. And from there we go uh, into the uh, common era times. But India provides this case study where you have this early, pretty much unknown empire of what's going on, who's leading it. 1400 years of we're farming again. And then two major powers coming into the area, followed by really that's when states as level societies become fully in- adopted into Indian culture. And that continues into today. Hmm. It's fundamentally interesting. There's a lot of cool stuff going on, and it's pretty pivotal uh, when we talk about like Western civilization, the, specifically the, the topics of the Aryans, the Indo-European languages. India is always kind of this periphery area, but it's central and uh, to early civil to early statehood society developing across the world, and they're part of a large interconnection between the Mediterranean, Eastern African coast. And then Southeast Asia and China, like they're kind of this, like they are today, a major uh, nexus of trade between two parts of the globe. And that's what they were on that early Indus civilization. Hmm. Rome didn't extend towards India, right? I don't, I don't think so. No. They kind of left no. the Levant. Yeah. They couldn't they get past Babylon. Nubia. Yeah. They ruled Babylon, they ruled Babylon yeah. for like a 10 year period and then had to bounce. Okay. Didn't they- Crassus and his son... They were killed by Babylonians or someone in, in the Middle East. Like, I'm pretty they, sure they killed him by with molten gold down his throat. Yeah. But the Roman, is, right? this region was, you know, traded with the Roman Empire. Yeah. You know, like, it's, if you, you know, we're they so had Bengal used to tigers and gladiator. Well, there you Sorry. go. <laughs> but uh, <laughs> then, then they had to have done. <laughs> No, but I think, you know, we're, you know, sad to say we're very used to viewing history from a a European centered perspective. And you, you know, you couldn't even help just then Carlton using the word periphery and that, you know, that's often how we view it, but really it's not the periphery. If you take like a, like a worldwide view, this is a real central region in the, you know, Bronze Age, Iron Age into the uh, ancient world. This is where a lot of the action is, is going on. Yeah. I think even in my world history class or world civilizations in freshman year, sophomore year of college, we just glanced over India. Like we learned a lot about China, Mesopotamia, the Greeks, Africa, the Americas, but like I don't really remember much about India or else I would be talking about it today. And is that because maybe that it's like, especially the Indus Valley civilizations hard to understand or is it just because we're Europeans and we don't want to? You know, we just focus more on Greece. I don't know. Bit of both, probably, I imagine. Yeah. Yeah. I mean, I learned a decent amount growing up because the community I grew up in was like marketed to Indian tech professionals. So like a lot of my friends growing up were from India and I learned a lot about Indian culture and traditional Indian food because they were straight from there. Some of the most brilliant people. And Suresh, God bless that man, was the only one that could stand my father in doubles tennis. Suresh the beast. I'm glad Suresh can do that. Uh, I've got one more thing to add. We we can't yeah. skip over this. We got one. We can't skip over this thing Please about do. Neolithic and the development of of society in oh. India. We've got to give a big shout out to 
Neil. Caleb Welch. Bronze oh. age. <laughs> Caleb Welch, yes. <laughs> I'm sure Caleb Welch is fully down for this nugget of information. So. <laughs> it may be the region that domesticated cannabis. Ah. Like this, uh, you know, the, the wild precursor to cannabis is a Central Asian plant. There are a ton of varieties of cannabis that grow naturally in the Himalayas, at least according to this book I have here entitled Cannabis Evolution and Ethnobotany by Robert, Slark, uh, Robert C. Clark and Mark Merlin. No doubt those guys are absolute legends. <laughs> but, um, <laughs> <laughs> but at least according to this book, cannabis, again, in those mentioning those earlier Indian texts, the Vedas, is regarded as one of the five kingdoms of herbs which release us from anxiety, Hmm. end quote. And they apparently used it to produce a drink called Bang. And cannabis use, you know, extends really far into prehistory, but this is definitely a contender for one of the first places that used it for its mind-altering abilities. In the Indus River Valley. In the Indus River Valley. So... That explains it. I feel it, like we need. That, we, that you know, explains. Like, that, we that don't exp- need a centralized <laughs> governor, man. We just like hang out. <laughs> just that live explains together. Fourteen hundred period without states, as everyone was just like, you know what? Let's just smoke some of this Kush. Yeah, exactly. So, <laughs> massive shout out to Neolithic India. Yeah, I'm gonna Why I'm gonna say lot. score one for the Neolithic today because. <laughs> yeah. Wow, I didn't know that. That's cool. So, like, some guys it's got a, wheat. It's a contender. We're not sure, but it, it definitely is, uh, you know, it's in the mix when it comes to early cannabis production. They're in the mix. Maybe that's just what they were selling there. Like, it was just a giant trading hub of... It was just a giant dispensary. <laughs> <laughs> you want some sour diesel? All right, you gotta go east. <laughs> not that I know strain names, but... <laughs> anyway, I'm taking a hole. You know, actually, it would be slight tangent. It would be kind of cool to have a, you know, archaeologically conscious cannabis company and you could name the strains like Mahenjo Dara's finest. Hey, you two live out on the coast there. Join forces. <laughs> Do you know what I mean? Beer archeo- archaeological beer archaeology has blown up. Maybe we should all get in on this. Yeah, we archaeological like weed stuff and get the the purest strains from across the globe. No, we gotta get we gotta find a, like a seed that that's still alive. An heirloom seed, yeah, yeah. And, then, and then yeah, and then breed it from there, yeah. Dad, get high like the Harappans. <laughs> yeah, it's not very potent. You get a out. slight headache, but man, you're gonna <laughs> chill out. <laughs> this is actually becoming too good of an idea. We might need to cut this out. <laughs> Let, <laughs> let's see. What are the names of these cities here? Okay. So yeah, Harappan High, Mega Remind Mesh, and then we got, <laughs> keep going. what do we got here? Uh, Aryan, you know, Aryan Don't Attack. Don't care, Diesel. We're call, yeah, we're not calling it Aryan anything. <laughs> it's a marketing nightmare. <laughs> that, that end is Kush. Yeah. Let's see, yeah, Kush, there you go. There's what already the Kush stuff. You, have hem- you do have like Afghan Kush. Mohenjo Diesel. <laughs> there we go. <laughs> All right. I'm done. Excellent. So, Stefan, thank you so much for coming back on the show, especially so last minute. We do appreciate your presence. It's been a lot of fun. As always, where can our listeners find all your all your Neolithic brilliance? Yeah. Go to youtube.com forward slash Stefan Milo. That's S-T-E-F-A-N-M-I-L-O. And that is on the internet. And watch my videos. I, when is this coming out? Like August. Uh, two weeks. So yeah. August uh, 23rd. Two weeks. So you guys will be able to watch our Neanderthals and Homo sapiens, the same species. But, but, yeah. Oh. Ooh. Get the popcorn out for that. I'm very excited for that one. Settle a uh, life and ruins dispute. Still, my favorite one is the uh, fundamental objections to Graham Hancock. 
where clearly used Microsoft Paint to put an Illuminati eye on the top of his forehead. <laughs> <Yeah>. <laughs> Microsoft Paint, I'll have you know that's a premium Photoshop job. Okay. Hey, man, uh, whatever works, works. It is what it is. Uh, someone commented on, how do I go to my community page? Oh, I know where this is. Um, community. Yeah, I thought this was neat, dude. Uh, I asked people, you know, what they thought about the last video or whatever. And somebody said, he said, I found you through Steph and me though, but your style is very different from his, which is good. It means I get similar and some dissimilar information that you have two different lenses. Stefan's work feels poetic and contemplative. Contemplative? I love his frequent use of the phrase, we just don't know, and others like it. I thought that was kind of cool. And then he talks uh, about mine, but I'm not going to toot my own horn in here. So. Uh, my favorite yeah. comment was, damn, Stefan, you really let yourself go. <laughs> <laughs> There's so many. There's also one. I I'm went and proud checked. proud son of the Neolithic. Okay. I mean, burgers and burritos. No, they're making fun of They're making fun of They're making fun of They're making fun of I occasionally go back and check the new comments on my video on your channel just to see what's there. And somebody goes, <laughs> I sent them a te- like screenshot of it and sent it to these guys. And I was like, get you an actor who has this range. And it was like, I love this. Thanks for introducing me to David. Someone said, damn, Stefan, you really let yourself go. And the last one said, I hate this guy. And I commented, <laughs> me too. <laughs> yeah, yeah. It's good uh, stuff. It's funny. It's funny. The you know the YouTube, the world of YouTube is is funny. Podcasters, you get off lightly with your lack of comments, lack right. of public comments. <laughs> I've never sifted through the comments on your videos, really, except for that one. But I imagine there's some very weird. Su- I got a lot of your follow or your subs come to my channel, and I get some weird messages and comments, and I assume they came from you. <laughs> It's actually just me and my 25 different <laughs> accounts. <laughs> Somebody asking me about, was there a mammoth domestication in the steps of Canada and stuff like that? I was like, I don't, I don't know, man. <laughs> uh, well, on that note, uh, you got your, you know, we found where, to, we know where to get you now. Sorry. The my op in Maui is getting me. So here we, <laughs> here we go. <laughs> What am I supposed to say now? Right. Please rate and review the podcast. If you guys have any qualms with this, if you are, you know, maybe a, a member of the, the, uh, you know, FDA, come, no, the FDA. Yeah. Yeah. FDA, DEA. There you go. Come tell us, you know, comment that if you like the podcast, let us know. But if not, you know, buy our merch, get a t-shirt, get some stickers. And of course you can find Stephen Milo on YouTube and on Instagram. All of his links are down below in the description. So thank you for joining us today, Stefan. Really appreciate your time, man. Take it Never easy, again. buddy. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> and with that, we are out. Thanks for listening to a Life in Ruins podcast. You can follow us on Instagram and Facebook at A Life in Ruins Podcast. And you can also email us at A Life in Ruins Podcast at gmail.com. And remember, make sure to bring your archaeologists in from the cold and feed them beer. So, gents, uh, what do you call a tree growing in the Indus River? Mm. An Indus tree. Oh, I literally was thinking that, but it's like, no, that's like factory industry. But, nope. Yikes. All right. That one was bad. Thank you, Connor. Yeah. This episode was produced by Chris Webster from his RV Traveling America, Tristan Boyle in Scotland, and the Archaeology Podcast Network, and was edited by Chris Webster. This has been a presentation of the Archaeology Podcast Network. Visit us on the web for show notes and other podcasts at www.archpodnet.com. Contact us at chris at archaeologypodcastnetwork.com.